Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the par participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you can send questions and comments to the YouTube chat. Uh, so hello, good evening to all of you watching on YouTube. And because we're live, I have to go fix Facebook. So I'm going to go fix that while we have the, uh, the rest of the hosts go around and do their brief introductions so I can figure out what's going on there. And we'll start with Juan. Good evening, Juan. Good evening, brothers. Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge, number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida. And the brother behind the gentlemansbrotherhood.com. And I'll lead over to Hambrecht, Brother Mike. You can introduce yourself, please. Yes, Mike the intern, Hammy, or just plain Mike uh, here from Lakeshore Lodge, <clears throat> number 307 in Madison, Ohio, where I am the current senior warden and lodge education officer. And I'm also senior steward of Castle Island Virtual Lodge. Good evening, everyone. And over to RJ. Oh, hey. How's it going, everybody? Robert Johnson, uh, Space Novum Lodge, 1183, current sitting secretary and uh, past master over at uh, the old Waukegan Lodge, 78 in Old Town, Waukegan, Illinois. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And, yeah, looks like Facebook's not cooperating tonight. But, uh, you know, we'll roll with the punches. So if, if, if you know people are watching over there, just send them over this way. Uh, so anyway, I do want to give a special shout out to all of the patrons who've been supporting the show, um, help us get our Facebook issues figured out. So thank you for all of you. If you want to help contribute to the future of Masonic education, head on over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable, where we will uh, we'll be using that, give you access to uh, secret behind the scenes type of things. Um, there's little Facebook chats and the like. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun to talk to you guys a little bit more personal. Uh, on a personal level back there so so thank you for everything you do for the future of freemasonry so tonight um we are going to talk about a a historical figure that i've been really curious about diving in and doing some research with and so um this gentleman goes by the name of reverend dr brother john theophilus desigulier so you know, or you can just call him Johnny or Desi. Surprisingly, his friends called him Desi for short. <laughs> so, um, what uh, what fascinated about me about this this uh, this brother is um, I had always heard that he was the third Grand Master of the Premier Grand Lodge of England um, in 1719. So we're gonna we're gonna dive a little bit into uh, the man and the character that that this guy was, and some of the things that he did contribute to the fraternity as a whole. Let's see. I, I do have a couple of let's see slides here just to have something pretty to look at, so you don't uh, focus just on me, because you don't want to see that. Let's head on over to uh, John Theophilus Desigulier. Okay, so this is uh, this is the gentleman, uh, Reverend Doctor Brother John Theophilus Desigulier, which I always find interesting that his name. Um, his middle name, Theophilus, you know, I guess loosely translates to the love of God, like the, lo the love of theology. Uh, so, um, which is very apropos because he was the son of a Protestant minister. Um, and he was with the name Desigulier. You would assume, rightfully so, that he was born in, uh, in France. And then um, actually when he was young, uh, moved to London where um, he set up a French school. Uh, in Islington, so he um, he was he was there. But what was interesting was that his father, the pastor, actually died when uh, John was only 16 years old. So he had this this establishment moved out of his home country, um, and while while brilliant, even at a young age, uh, and interested in in religious aspects, uh, he just he was fatherless at a very young age, and so um, that was one thing I learned the, the more research that I did. So um, as he advanced in in life, we really don't know a whole lot about his early years. 
Uh, but we do know that he then um, started to go into uh, grammar school and then entered into Christ Church in Oxford and um, got his, uh, his Bachelor of Arts in 1709. And he continued on to get not only a master's degree, um, he then also got uh, an honorary doctorate degree in civil laws and was then called Dr. Du Dr. Desaguliers in 1719, um, and then actually incorporated by Cambridge University. That honorary degree became an actual doctorate degree um, by Cambridge University in 1726. So uh, very studious and actually loved to give lectures. Meanwhile, um, so this was, you know, 1719, he got his honorary doctorate. Um, but he was actually even ordained as a deacon in 1710 and then as a priest in 1717, which is interesting when you look at the timelines of early Freemasonry, right? 1717, we should all know that date as the, uh, the founding of the Premier Grand Lodge of England. The almost founding of the Grand Lodge of England? Almost, sort of, kind of. The almost founding? The <laughs> maybe? The asterisk? What? Or fraudulently? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There's been a lot of refute about that lately. A good piece in the uh, recent Ancient Accepted Scottish Rites uh, uh, Research Society uh, article. But I digress. No, no, please. This, this is, this is, I love this because I want, I want this, this style to be uh, a little bit back and forth. Oh, okay, yeah. I, there was a really great um, article that was published uh, via the Scottish Rite Research Society um, in the latest uh, hard book that they sent out. And um, I'm, I'm dying a little bit because I cannot remember who wrote it, but you'll like, know the name. It looks, looks like, like Mike's got him. It. He's going for it. He's, He's going it. for it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I read it and I thought. I, I don't buy it. It feels like these guys got. It, it feels like the it's, author of this article is attacking. Was it Rick Berman? Because it's the one origins of yeah. Freemasonry yeah, and yeah, the invention yeah. of tradition, yeah. a rebuttal. Yeah. Yeah. R Rick Berman's yep. rebuttal. Um, and I love Rick Berman has written amazing things about yes. that, but I just felt like, I kind of felt like Rick Berman was attacking the people rather than their argument. Hmm. But I, f I feel like their argument was good too. So, I don't know. I don't really have as I was, as I, yeah, as I was looking earlier, I, I won't go into this too much, but as I was looking at it earlier again, because I was, because I'm preparing to redo my uh, presentation, I did at the 300. Uh, I'm beginning to wonder if they weren't attacking a lot of the wrong things too, though. A um, little bit too much uh, ad hominem attacks on Desigulier and Sayer and so forth. Hmm. So. But I have to really reread it, so I'm not really criticizing it that way just yet. So right. <laughs> nobody hang me out to dry for that. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, so again, he's he's becoming a deacon in 1710, pre 1717, seven years later. Um, so he's he's really good at lecturing. In fact, that's what he gets to be known for is his the way he can work a crowd, loves to give lectures, and. Um, in fact, he, you could call him like the early carrot top. He's like the prop guy because whenever he gives a lecture, he's giving fascinating demonstrations, um, which actually got him his foot in the door with the, the Royal Society in England uh, because um, they needed a new replacement to their, I uh, forgot the, the term they called it, uh, the demonstrator. Uh, so that way someone could describe vi visually what's going on. Um, and so he actually ended up actually per Isaac Newton's request, who was president of the Royal Society at the time in 1714, um, invited Desaguliers to replace, uh, Francis Hawksby as demonstrator in society's weekly meetings. And he just wowed Newton. Uh, they became very, very close friends. He apprenticed under Newton for quite a bit. Uh, Newton not being a Freemason, uh, not really, never was or really proven, but you know, we, we do know that he, they all stayed in the same kind of circles. So, um, so Desaguliers is, is um, there and he's doing these demonstrations, he's setting these things up, and in fact he, he becomes a fellow 
shortly thereafter of the uh, Royal Society of you know the fellow of the Royal Society. Now, if, if you're not familiar, the, the Royal Society at the time was really the top brass of, of thinkers um, at that time. Of course, again, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was, was a member uh, of this. Uh, Elias Ashmole, who's kind of the first known documented Freemason, was a member of the Royal Society at this time. Um, and so this was like the inner circle of the aristocratic scientific elite, if that makes sense. So he's, he's hanging out in all these circles. He's making friends. He loves to talk, loves to give these demonstrations. Um, and becomes very well known to, to, to give lectures. Uh, in fact, some even would say that uh, some of his demonstrations that he gave uh, were actually on the close of being like stage magic because he, he would do things where he could make um, large copper tubes turn silver, like just in a flash, um, for, you know, for dramatic effect, of course. He could make uh, a cork floating sink on command. He could do all these like weird things, all based in science, but it was his, you know, his, his bag of tricks that he had when he would give these demonstrations. So um, it, he, it really helped set him up for his, not flair for the dramatic, but definitely um, his experience and skill of orating, of knowing people, being in the right circles, and, and really uh, having a good stage presence. And so I found that to be interesting that uh, he's, he was known to have hundreds of demonstrations, right, of actual different props. Robert. So I got a question, and it maybe boils down to, like, uh, socioeconomic status of the mm -hmm. day. But, man, when you said that this guy has – he's both a doctor and a, and he's a priest at a point, um, just in your research, have you found that – like in order to get a doctorate like this required you to have access or to be somehow, um, I don't know, have, you know, having a, a voice in the church. Um, I mean, I know like, you know, Lutheranism is very much considered the, 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 the religion that attached itself to the library. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just curious if they were like mutually exclusive. I mean, a lot of times you always hear that the only people who ever got the education was to go into the church. So, right? so one, one part of my research, really good question. Um, <clears throat> even though he matriculated at the age of 16, he was actually 22 when he actually went to Oxford. So there's this huge gap in time and that's primarily due to his father's death in 1699 and had no money. His father left him nothing. Uh, so he had to earn his own living. <clears throat> so he really was a pull yourself up uh, by the bootstraps kind of guy. Uh, so that was really interesting. So, it, I, and that's what I was trying to figure out. Was he born into money? Like, how did that work? Because uh, it w really wasn't clear on, on the first pass of research. But um, this guy, uh, other other sources that I, that I, I gathered for this really show that he was kind of, um, he worked the crowd, like, again, he he knew everybody he was well connected and he was full of energy like if you wanted something done you give it to him right you know what they say if you want something done give it to a busy person right because they'll find a way to get it done he was that guy um very charismatic um but also was was everywhere he was like you know um he was just always hyped up full of energy and so i think that energy got him into those places that he needed to go uh, get access to those things so that's a good question Mm -hmm. um, so another thing that fascinated me because another thing to note about the Royal Society at that time is that the Royal Society was actually it was science light uh, you know um, there's a, a really good uh, book that I read a couple of years ago um, I think it's called uh, Clockwork Universe or something like that I'll have to look it up um, but really it's not as, when we think science today, we think of, you know, running controlled experiments and, and really making sure that everything is, is, you know, you're dotting your I's, crossing your T's, and you're running it meticulously so that it can be created later. The scientific method really hadn't flushed out around this time period. So what we find is that science was really like 
Hey, I heard Bobby across the street knows how to turn lead into gold. Oh, really? That sounds interesting. Why don't you invite Bobby over? You know, and so it was it was a weekly meeting of scientific like minds, but they didn't have the rigor of a repeatable process. So the history of the Royal Society, while some really cool things came out of it, like Newton's, you know, gravity and all that stuff, um, laws, laws of motion. That was a byproduct of being in, in, in with like-minded people, but it also, the other half of the time, they were really talking about things that were kind of on the edge of like pseudoscience. Uh, a, a little like, alchemy, a little philosophy, a little, you yes. know, because wasn't there, I mean, isn't there publication, the philosophical transactions of Correct. the Royal that's Society? The, that's that's so, the name yeah. of, their, of their, uh, their magazine, right? Uh, of which uh, Desagoulier, through his career, actually published 60 articles for the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. So uh, again, no, no, no slump either for writing as well as lecturing. So he's, he's working hard, but remember at, at this time, now he's the, like an understudy to Newton. So here's where I want to kind of go off the path a little bit of the story because you can't just not just put him with Newton and then not really talk about Newton's influence to him. So again, we know Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was not a Freemason, but um, was very interested, you know, knew, knew lots of them, um, did a lot of, of study in, in the sciences, um, the liberal arts and sciences. Uh, but um, another thing to mention is that he, uh, that Newton himself, which I've been fascinated about, we may have talked about this in uh, earlier sections is that uh, Newton was like a hermetic scientist. He was really into oh, what we got there, Robert uh, Isaac Newton's Freemasonry, the alchemy and science of mysticism. I haven't read that one, but that's that looks like a great one. Um, have you you read it? You have you haven't skimmed it yet? No, it, like, the spine isn't even cracked. I picked it up at half price books, but um, the title of you know, I mean Isaac Newton such a handsome man and uh, having the title mysticism <laughs> and science in it. I'm like, like oh, I'll take I'm it. All in. <laughs> I'm all yeah, in. Yeah. 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 So, so Newton himself, um, one thing I find felt fascinating was that um, over 50%, over 50% of all known Newton's writings were on alchemy. So we know Newton scientifically as, you know, uh, gravitational fields and laws of motion and the like, you know, uh, which really helps establish the framework for objects in motion in space, right, to give us our, our planetary system. But really, he spent more than half of his writing, maybe not his time, but his writing on uh, on alchemy, on spiritual alchemy, and actually trying to turn lead into gold. Uh, some of those have since been found and scanned, so I, I kind of encourage you to go look that up online to see if you can, you too, can turn lead into gold. <laughs> But um, as such, here, I'm going to show you um, another piece of published work. This is actually um, a published work from John Theophilus de uh, which is called A Course of Experimental Philosophy, uh, published in 1734. <clears throat> and one of his lectures con uh, concerned Isaac Newton's recently established Three Laws of Motion. So... In this picture here, we see uh, a planetarium or orrery to visualize the motion of the heavenly bodies in our solar system, according to the Copernican system, which is more circular. Um, by turning a crank, the planets and the Earth are set in motion around the sun. So this is a hand-drawn slash hand-built um, contraption that, that he took Newton's laws and started, started applying them uh, in here. And um, so... So heavily influenced by, by Newton at the time. Again, Newton um, also wrote a lot on the uh, sacred geometry, divine geometry of King Solomon's temple. There's been lots published about his fascination where he uh, or Newton thought that the uh, dimensions of King Solomon's temple as, as defined you know, in the Bible were actually kind of like divine proportions and was truly trying to make something more philosophical out of it. <clears throat> so uh, 
again, how, how could he study it that much, study alchemy that much, and not influence Desaguliers at the same time? So, they, so while we don't have any direct proof of Desaguliers practicing the hermetic arts and sciences, he's in the same circles with these guys. He's talking to them every day, all day. So, you know, basically the conclusion is there's, there's really no way that Desaguliers was not an alchemist at this time. Remember, alchemy and science were still kind of one and the same. Right? So you have a lot of the spiritual aspects. You still have the concentration of the church into the science as well. Um, and the more that I read about what he uh, Desaguliers published, going back to Desaguliers now, um, I was fascinated to see how much of an engineer he was too. So uh, as, as an electrical engineer myself, I found that kind of cool um, where he, let's see, here's, here's another... Uh, picture of another thing that he's published where um, he was actually known as one of the top 23 leading uh, scientists in the science of tribology. What is tribology? It's actually the study of fluid and motion and friction and lubrication. Uh, so he, here you see lots of different glass tubes with different uh, fluids and, and air pockets in them and all these different ways you could shape them and form them so you could measure <clears throat> the hydraulics and and you know, the pneumatics that go with that so um so we we know he's very good in the church he's he's rolling in the uh the hermetic arts but now he's, this is like no kidding a scientific legacy that he's leaving behind in fact we also know that um he has several patents that you can go you can go and, and search for and and find those. He was fascinated with steam engines at the time. Uh, we mentioned hydraulics um, and studying motion, just all things motion fascinated him. He even studied the human body in motion. He would watch how pe people would jump off of things and try to get, you know, um, copy their muscle structure and figure out how, how things work. So at this point, with all of these, these published drawings and studying of human motion i'm i'm really getting a um leonardo da vinci vibe out of all this so and that's just i want you to really kind of get that image of him <laughs> as a scientist as an engineer um this whole time and what i found too is i was doing some other uh digging here he actually wrote some some very interesting articles on electricity uh created the what the uh conductor or named the conductor and insulator which I kind of thought that was something that uh, Franklin had done, but no, he Franklin did some other things, the battery and so forth. And positive and but, negative, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I found interesting in that thinking is it's a shame for the year that uh, the age and the years that um, Desaguliers passed away as opposed to when uh, Franklin was actually in uh, England they they missed each other but they were oh, really? contemporaries in reality i mean because yeah because they have you know yeah they missed each other they never actually met from what i could find so far um which would be a shame with all the experimentation that also franklin had done on electricity having seen that article i was just like wow that would have been uh, an awesome merging of the minds i think exactly yeah um and of course you're, you're getting all these scientific influences across across London and, and, and the, the states at the time, too. So, yeah, I'm glad you picked that up because um, as an electrical engineer, I found that pretty cool to see him dabble in that space as well, on top of everything else that he was already studying and, and an ordained minister and, you know, um, all these other things. Uh, in addition to the pneumatics, uh, created a more efficient fireplace that used to, was able to pull air in and, and make a you know make the fire burn longer and and also a blowing wheel which actually circulated air out of buildings so when you have stale air in an old building he invented a machine that would like suck the air out and pull it to the outside uh so yeah, this guy well, today we would just call that an air handler right but yeah exactly a fan yeah. so put a box fan in the window you're good to go so yeah he this guy was fascinating just from an engineering standpoint um and yet we know him much more for his Masonic endeavors. But um, I was just blown away by the, the engineering prowess. He, he himself could, you know, has done what you know, multiple men uh, couldn't have done in a lifetime. And um, 
it had to, had to be access to Newton and that society. Robert? John, I, yeah, I was going to mention, like, I, I can only imagine what people would accomplish today had we put so many people in the same room. I mean, uh, I by no means am, am I like, uh, this is not a love letter, le, a love letter to Oppenheimer, right? But like when they needed to make a bomb, Oppenheimer put together a dream team. You know, uh, to be in the room of a dream team like these people were has to be incredible. Um, I had another question for you, and it kind of relates to, you said, you know, the church at this time is is involved in science too. And so, not to digress or anything, but I'm curious on your thoughts. You know, in that period of time, when the church has like a vested interest in science, uh, much like science, there's just an analogy. I'll just jump to it. Uh, the church interested in science to see the predictability or understand God better, as in maybe a mathematician or an ec- an economist might look at the market to see what happens with the market, right? Like, is it an investigation to predict or to understand, or is it like a legitimate thing that they're interested in because of the betterment of humanity. I, I only ask because I think there's a general malaise that a lot of people have today that would go, well, the church would never have been about science, right? Because it's like uh, 14th century dad. You've seen the meme, 14th century dad. The daughter says, I know math. And he's like, get the stakes ready. <laughs> you know, um, Burn her. She's a witch. Yeah. Right. Thoughts um, on that just through your research, through that lens? Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> just in my understanding and study of Newton, the man, um, highly re- religious person. And so remember, this is still like early Church of England, right, where um, the church and the state are one, right? And so, you know, basically everything, like when you woke up and you ate, ate your Wheaties for breakfast. That was, that was because God told you know, wanted you to, right? Everything was God inspired. Everything was, was part of the church. Uh, so even the science at the time was all through the lens of, of God, because that's everybody, everybody knew about God. So like the, the concept of a deist or an atheist, like would, that would, that would hurt their heads like that. So, um, so separating the, divine inspiration from the science or from the math that that wasn't a thing and so um it, it's it's not to say was there some sort of church influence to make you know to understand god better or was there some sort of church influence to control science it it, it was neither it was it was just that that's the way things were it's the way they always were you know, that if you weren't religious something was wrong with you back then and so um, while that did taint a lot of the science, again, how, how Newton, um, you know, just went, well, you know, almost insane trying to find these divine proportions, uh, King Solomon's Temple, for example, and, and, and study alchemy, um, spiritual alchemy, as well as operative alchemy. It, it's, it wasn't to an end, it was because that's the way it was, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Oh, and just uh, two other things, um, some other character traits of Desaguliers. Um, he was an occasional poet and an actor, right? So he's, this guy does everything. He's, uh, which is really important for setting up why he was so influential in joining Freemasonry as well as becoming Grand Master. Uh, so we talked about his stint in the, uh, the Royal Society. I think I covered most of my points there. Um, so let's talk about and shift over to his Masonic career. What do we know him as, as a Mason? Well, in fact, we don't know much about how he got started as a Mason, because if he is the third Grand Master, that means he had to have been a Mason prior to what we know is the organization and collection of the Premier Grand Lodge of England in 1717. Right. So we think he was initiated and passed, not raised, because there was no third degree at the time, uh, right. somewhere between 1712 and 1715. Because at this point of the circles he was in, this was probably early Royal Society days, like his joining was a social coup. 
Like, we want this guy who everybody knows, everybody likes. He's a prop comic. He's like, he's everywhere. We want him in into the fraternity. Um, which uh, he then, uh, as Reverend Dr. Brother Desaguliers, also teamed up with uh, Reverend Anderson, right, to help get this, this thing off the ground um, and help, actually, I think, in one of the latter prints of Anderson's Constitutions, Desaguliers wrote the foreword to. Uh, not the first one, but but the, some of the subsequent ones later on. Um, right, but they worked together on the on the uh, uh, 1723 copy. Yes, they worked together on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, in some of my research, thank you for that because that that helps me pull some threads where uh, we think he had some influence in narrating the story, the embellishment of Freemasonry, right? because you know, as we talked about in an earlier episode of tmr how you know you look at anderson's constitutions it says look it goes all the way back to adam we can trace masonry all the way back then it's 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 meant to be a story it's meant to build up mm -hmm. the the origin story of freemasonry mm -hmm. there's actually uh from what i understand there was i mean i don't know too much about the fact behind this piece but there has been a rumor out there that desagulier actually did most of the work on what became Anderson's Constitutions, hmm. but that he let because he didn't want his influence to drive the Constitution's publication and marketing, he let Anderson put his name on it. But I don't, I mean, I don't have a lot of facts to back that up. I just remember reading that in several little pieces out there going, well, it's believed because Anderson wasn't all that smart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, this uh, and I wouldn't very... know, smart is the probably wrong way. Literate is the, the word. That's know. a very important point. Robert? This sounds very Baconian slash Sherlockian. Uh, you know <laughs> oh, what I mean? You mean uh, Bacon and Sh uh, uh, Shakespeare? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. I, I, <laughs> I do apologize. Shakespeare and Francis Bacon, you know, transposing those yeah. two. Um who really wrote it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's there's also some thoughts on that. You know, maybe that's another episode, right? Hidden authors, um, but there's there's also uh, about who who really wrote the Constitution, also. Mm -hmm. So of the um, United States, I should say. There you go. So the um, let's see. So we know 1717. He helped form the Grand, the Premier Grand Lodge of England. Uh, remember, at this point in time, uh, masonry was still in that transition state into speculative masonry. Okay, so uh, Jason's done a lot of history in Freemasonry in Scotland, and you know that it's very much an operative guild system. And the shift to speculative uh, masonry was was pretty rough. Uh, in fact, you know some lodges still hold on to their operative charters, right? right? Um, Pre Grand Lodge, and so here in in London, because of the aristocratic nature of Desaguliers, it it actually to to your point, Hammy and Robert, it would not have been a good choice to stick a snooty aristocrat over top of an operative system. Okay, so I think there was he was deliberately put on as a ladder Grand Master. So that way you could ease in the operatives, like because you know these operative lodges are doing their own thing, they're they're fine. They don't have they don't need this this uh, grand lodge to tell them what to do. But in a few short years, it goes from this decentralized network of lodges to now having a grand authority that can warrant and charter lodges. In like a matter of like five to ten years. So that's a big mm -hmm. shift. Um, but they had to be very careful that they didn't just stick some aristocrat as the first grandmaster uh they needed to kind of ease into it so that that transition could happen uh over a longer longer period of time right and so you have like... in 17 oh go ahead Arjun. no no you uh could make sense then that you get um desagulier in as grandmaster in 1719 and that's when he starts bringing in a lot of these noblemen as masons you know and getting even those that have been that that were noble but were not as active, he brings them all back into being active because these are the guys he knows. He's bringing them in, and he's actually bringing it to the more speculative masonry and less operative side of things. 
uh, and, and, and it keeps that flow going through into obviously when they say 1721, when you get the first, what is the Duke of Mont, is Duke of Montague, right? That becomes the grandmaster. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So okay. He, he becomes the, the grandmaster of, um, the premier grand lodge of England in 1719. Okay. So again, this is like what, five years possibly of him being passed to the degree of fellow craft uh, because there's no third degree yet, which is fascinating. So obviously he has not had much of a long Masonic career to put him right there at the top. Uh, in fact, I don't think there's any record of him being master of a lodge or anything by that point in time. So another piece of evidence, that it's like he was just stuck there as a figurehead because uh, that never happens in masonry, right? So you put a popular guy in charge uh, it, despite his experience. Somebody's <laughs> so, going to expel you for saying that. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of makes sense to, to your point, though, John, because now you've got, you've got somebody who's coming into the fraternity who has influence and an ability. Like, let's just say, if you want to get something off the ground, mm -hmm. uh, an organization, for whatever the means may be, Maybe you want to be one of these people who says, like, you know, nefarious reasons and you, you want a group of people who can control government or whatever. You know, likely not those things. But uh, if you want to grow, you need to put somebody in there who's able to help you grow. Um, and I think he was one of those people who just had this influence. Um, it's not uncommon, right? Like right. when we did Masonic Presidents, you posted the picture, you pulled it up. Scottish Rite makes him an honorary Scottish Rite Mason. This is, of course, Ronald Reagan. You just pick somebody of prominence. Uh, you know, it, you get brownie points immediately just for having been associated with such a person. I don't, I don't know. It just it feels that way anyway. It does. Yeah, no, I, I see your, your point. Absolutely. So um, so he becomes Grand Master, um, and then uh, about three years or two years later, 1721, he's documented to have gone to visit a lodge of Edinburgh in Scotland, 17 August, 1721. And what's there is we find that there's probably good evidence of the conversations that were there either helped him shape or finalize the form of what we know now as the third degree. Because at this point in time, in 1721, there is no evidence of a Master Mason degree being held, conferred, titles given to. So, um, but we do know that 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 date really influenced a lot of his uh, nudging of the third degree. So, uh, there is a, a recent article from the Quattro Coronati um, Lodge just came out uh, this this past year, in fact, where um, it really gives a lot more evidence and credence to uh, Desagulier helping to shape and create the the third degree of masonry, or at least as we would recognize it today. Um, so let's, let's talk about the third degree. Um, some aspects of the third degree were actually currently, or at the time, currently in the Fellowcraft degree, including uh, points of fellowship and the giving of the Mason's word. In fact, that's why it's called the points of fellowship, because it is for the fellow craft, hence the name. Um, but what we do find later, uh, so this is 1721, he, he meets the, the Lodge in Edinburgh, and then we actually see some evidence by 1725 of Master Masons being made um, in Scotland and other places. Um, also, when you look at the difference between the first two degrees and the third degree, the third degree is full of, of lots of New Testament references as compared to uh, Old Testament references in the previous degrees. Um, being a, an ordained minister really helps to help shape these things, as well as being an actor, a poet, a scientist. You, you can see all of his background is coming in to shape this thing into a third degree system. <clears throat> and in fact, um, part of the smoking gun of at least tying Desagulier uh, directly attributable to part of creating the third degree uh, comes from this thing called the, the Briscoe pamphlet. Um, and the Briscoe pamphlet uh, was really a, cr a critique or criticism of the 
uh, of the degree work that was going on at the time. <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some of this because it actually calls him out by name. Um, where it says, you know, this is just an excerpt, but our learned doctor of laws, to show his extraordinary reading, takes a great deal of pains to prove that Hiram, the founder in brass, a Tyrian, was not Hiram King of Tyre, uh, when as the sacred text is so expressly plain in these words, and the King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was a widow's son of the tribe of Natfly, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding, and cunning to work in all works of brass. Thus far, the holy penman, but the most ingenious Dr. Desagulier, to make this Hiram, who was a founder and carver in brass, a stonecutter or Freemason, as you may suppose, has found out the very letter of recommendation which King Hiram sent to Solomon, which, run, which runs thus, and now I have sent a cunning man, endued with understanding, skillful now to work in gold, silver, brass, iron, stone, timber, purple, blue, and fine linen, and crimson, also to grave any manner of graving, like engraving, and to find out every device which shall be put upon him. Here you find our Freemason now as a mere jack of all trades, a goldsmith, a silversmith, a brazier, a ironmonger, stonecutter, timber merchant, sawyer, carpenter, or joiner, and a linen draper, and a fine scarlet dyer. When all it said in the Book of Kings is, will we read no more of him than he was a founder of castor or brass and other metals so what we're seeing here is a critique of this this newly found third degree um he'd already created this hiram uh, hiramic legend by now 1723 so this is this is again the the critique is dated 1723 with his name on it saying how he's uh, embellished the characteristic of hiram as of not hiram of tyre not not King Hiram of Tyre. Um, and so we do find the earliest recorded raising of a master mason was on f 1 February 1725, just, just two years later. Um, so I find that to be uh, not quite a smoking gun, but, but a pretty darn good evidence of his name being tied to the creation of this, this third myth. And so we, we, again, we do have evidence of the master mason degree being worked in Scotland by 1725. Um, so, you know, he went on to be very active with the Grand Lodge system uh, for many, many years after that. Um, he, he, he died on the 29th of February, 1744, and from his, his days as Grand Master in 1719 uh, to, to 1744, was still very active in establishing, forming, growing the Grand Lodge system, uh, lodges started being chartered uh, left and right based, you know, just for many years after that. So it really started taking off. And, you know, just kind of like he was, I think he was a, uh, what we would consider like a district deputy Grand Master for at least three other times after being Grand Master. So again, he wasn't, he wasn't a slacker after, after uh, jumping right into that Grand Line. And so Died on 29 February 1744, was buried on 6 March 1744 um, within the Savoy Chapel in London. So that's, that's how his, his story ends. Um, but I just in conclusion wanted to kind of tie it back that this guy was truly a Renaissance man of his time coming from just pretty much you know penniless uh, to be very in tune with his faith be known to lecture and orate with his faith as a minister, become fascinated with science, get in the right scientific circles, um, and become part of, you know, the ground floor of Freemasonry, uh, where it was very, very politically savvy. I mean, they really don't say that, but you can read between the lines, as we talked about earlier, uh, politically savvy enough to be at the right place at the right time, know the right people, to really help shape and grow grow that. Um, and, and again, just my personal, like, infatuation with kind of the esoteric spiritual side of masonry it's it's good to see I, I really wanted to see what was it specifically he added in at a third degree and really couldn't get a whole lot um out of the research but you know he, he definitely left left an impression on on freemasonry going forward and i think that's something admirable that we should all you know respect and, and you know look back upon so that's that's all i got what, what questions do you have I was going to ask you, 
about your final question there. What what real influence did he have on his third degree? And the only thing I can think of is like, you know, we're data dudes. So mm -hmm. of course all I'm thinking of is like what are the what are the books that are being published in that time? What do we see as like the the en vogue topics in discoveries? What are these organizations really talking about? in the years, you know, we don't have to look too far, like 1710 to 1725. What is going on there? What's in vogue? What are these people talking about? And then you can kind of see who's talking about what, and then maybe have a better idea. I mean, it's always going to be kind of a, you yeah. know, uh, and you a know, smoky glass, you know, to, to, to figure it out. But yeah, there's, I'm um, just, I'm wondering. There is there is the the reference, um, and I know Jason has done more research into it uh, than I have about the the Noahide uh, play, where you know we have Shem Ham and Japheth um, trying to uh, receive some not secret knowledge from from their father, um, even after he's dead, and so they have um, a recasting of that story uh, to the third degree as we know it today. Um, and some of my sources say, well, you know, that there might not be a direct link there. That, that in fact, that uh, that Noahite degree may actually be a fabrication as well. Um, Hammy? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say because uh, this because uh, before you brought that up, I was sitting here waiting for my opportunity. Uh, it, when Anderson's Constitutions get published, there is that the Freemasons were cast as the Noahides, the, true the Noahide. followers of the seven laws of Noah. And it, it, it includes the seven laws of Noah. Do not deny God. Do not blaspheme God. Do not murder. Do not engage in incest, adultery, uh, pederasty, or bestiality. Do not steal. Uh, do not eat of a live animal and establish court's legal system to ensure obedience to the law. And those are the, I mean, that's, you know, masonry in so many ways, you know. Um, and the fact is, though, I mean, it, what, what makes me uh, even more curious about that whole connection there is the fact that we know that uh, Desigulier helped with the Anderson's constitutions, and yet he drove us away from the Noachide degree system to the Hiramic legend instead. It almost begs the curiosity why, you know. Yeah. Unless he had his, you know, own reasons or that it was more widely used is a good thing I would say, but, you know. I will add a little bit of an epilogue um, that uh, our, our friend and brother P.D. Newman uh, published in the Fraternal Review back in October of 2019, um, where they noted that prior to Desigulier's stint as Grand Master, there was no mention made in the Masonic ritual of a sprig of acacia. It, rather, the reference was to a sprig of cassia, a cinnamon-like plant originating in southern China. And um, so you have to wonder if there, uh, there was some sort of hallucinogenic influence from Desigulier, right? If he's dabbling in all these other things, dabbling in alchemy, uh, that there should be some sort of... Um, um, ethnogenic type of influence as well. And so he says, you can't, you can't show a direct correlation, but prior to Desigulier coming in and messing with the script, it went from Cassia to Acacia. It wasn't, it wasn't a mistranslation. There was a deliberate change. I think it's fascinating to me because all I can think about, like the, 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 com the, uh, the comedy writer in me just wants to see, you know, like, Daryl Hammond portraying Bill Clinton, you know, like passing a joint. <laughs> and now I want to see Desigulier being like, check the out. <laughs> this <Yeah>. is the substance. <laughs> My brothers. Yes. Look, I'm picturing like, you know, Moses coming down with the 15 crash, 10 commandments. <laughs> but it's like, it's the Cassia. I mean, Acacia. It's Acacia, guys. It says it right here. It says Acacia the whole time. I don't know what you've been reading. <laughs> I need well, Brady the, McCoy the question, to make a cartoon. 
The question, without getting into too much of the detail on it, though, is that can they cassia, not the you know not the alchemical side of it or the you know the drug based side of it, can it do the same thing as the acacia that we know is part of the symbolism of why we use the acacia? I mean, that would be a question to look into to see if that's why he even made the switch too, for that matter. It does seem to fit in the in the in the sense of. Uh objective and um, similar notions, I suppose, within all religions, organized or not, there is this element of the, uh, not a true transmigration of souls, but uh, the plant itself, as we use it today, embodies that idea. Whereas I think maybe the Cassia might have a more difficult time um, making a correlation to the degrees as they exist today. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, obviously I don't have a, a mind to be changed. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Juan, any, any questions you've had, any thoughts, any, any research you found about this guy? The one thing that stood out the most for me that was most interesting you alluded to it when you mentioned that the parallels between him and Leonardo da Vinci, um, not only was he a, a brilliant mind that utilized illustration as a tool for not just convincing people of the science of the time, but to be able to procure support for further research. And you see the same with this, uh, this Agulier because he actually has connections with the Royal family. He would do experiments for them and and thereby not just get their support you know from a nod a royal nod but also financially so uh, you can see how attractive it it would be to have someone of his stature and his connections uh, to be part of this great experiment of uh, of a unified freemasonry uh, through the grand lodge um, he also had a parallel with uh, with Leonardo, where he was estranged from his father early on. Uh, so you see the the dynamics that play. Uh, if you if you if you think of Leonardo da Vinci, he spent the rest of his life trying to impress other men. And I wouldn't put that past this individual. It's like part of his overachievement comes from that in, in, uh, insatiable desire to. Uh, for recognition or for uh, approval uh, of sorts. So I just thought it was it was very interesting that he, you know, they share that that parallel. And I didn't find anything. You know, of course, I have just like some of the things that you've mentioned. My suspicions of oh, could he have had some influence in the. Uh, For example, the development of the third degree or, you know, what hand did he play in that considering that he um, was so comfortable utilizing illustrations and he was familiar, of course, with um, Newton's uh, study of the the proportions of the 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 Temple of Solomon and all kind of stuff. Like, could he have been part of the instrument that brings that? Uh, that whole story into the into the fold, but who knows? But it's just interesting. All right. Okay, so uh, we're at that time now to start wrapping up the conversation. I want to ask everyone the final question, and the final question, starting with uh, Hammy, is: Do you think that Freemasonry would be the same had Desaguliers not been in the fraternity? What are your thoughts? No, no, I really don't. Um, I, to be honest, uh, the amount of influence that I could find in everything that I've read about him, uh, without him, I have a feeling it would not have, it might not have gone as far as it did. You know, uh, I'm not saying that it would not have lasted, you know, a couple hundred years as well. I'm just saying that I don't think without his influence, without his bringing back the less active members that he knew about, uh, and bringing in a lot of the the nobles that he did bring in as well, uh, which then 
continued this on into a much larger scale. Uh, I don't think it would have uh, carried on as well. Um, I do know that, you know, obviously we had, you know, eventually the um, ancients, because the premier was actually the moderns, uh, a startup, but I don't know if we would have ended up in that direction even, you know. Uh, it's, it's hard to say, but without his influence, it would not be what it is today. I don't, I mean, I don't even know if we'd have a third degree without him. So. I'm going to have to agree with you on that. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Juan, what, what say you? Do you think masonry would be the same, different? had he not been involved? Well, uh, I'm not sure how much of a of an influence directly. Uh, I'm not sure that I see a, a direct link with um, how it ended up. But it, it does show me the importance that we, we don't operate in a vacuum. It doesn't matter how great one individual is within the organization. It is a it's a guild and it's a matter of all of us connecting together to to do the very best for the organization so would it be the same you know i don't know how i don't know how the ripples would look you know would it be different yeah perhaps just like from a butterfly effect uh point of view uh but but more importantly is i, I like the highlight of most Masons don't know the name de Segulier, and yet he, he was very influential in at the time. So we could have those same kind of individuals today um, who are very influential, yet their names will just be a, a footnote in the majority of the craft. Uh, but anyway, very interesting conversation. Thank you so much, brothers, for for putting together the, the research, John, amazing presentation. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had to remind myself, oh, write some questions, <laughs> get involved. You're not just watching the Masonic round table on YouTube. Don't just grab the bag of popcorn uh, and start going, going at it. Yeah. If, I felt a little bit like that, but thank you so much for, yeah. for carrying the weight on this one. You did, right. you did a great job. Right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again, everybody for listening to the Masonic round table. Alrighty, Robert. Same, better, worse? What say you? It's really hard to tell. I mean, when I think back about these kind of things, I, I think honestly, you look at the history of Freemasonry as it existed prior to the <clears throat> uh, the speculative era, right? So you look at an operative guild type era, and people are uh, taking their oaths on guild bylaws, agreeing to uh, terms of employment and, and all of these kinds of things. I mean, read them. But uh, then we think, well, why on earth would an aristocrat have wanted to join such an organization? And I mean, I think if you think about that um, intrinsically, the, those reasons are probably apparent. Uh, no need to go into them here, but I think ultimately what it does is that Freemasonry probably would not have been anything like it is today without people at least like Desigoulier, uh, meaning that with money and influence is equal to investing and in sustainability in the thing that you're in, whether or not that they were like, hey, let's get together and make sure this thing is sustainable and lasts for 300 years might not be, have been in the cards, uh, but it is no less a byproduct of their influence. Um, if not Desigoulier, then who? Uh, what if in some alt timeline we're having the same conversation, but instead of him, we're talking about Newton? You know, did they approach a couple guys and say, look, we got this org. We need somebody. Did, did Newton go, uh, talk to Desigoulier. <laughs> he's he's kind of into that stuff. I'm busy, you know, being weird uh, <laughs> with my mysticism, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being cool. Um, so, yeah, I think masonry wouldn't be where it is today without somebody like him. But his particular areas of interest 
if you had just had any old aristocrat in that position, no, we'd have a really prim and proper type mm -hmm. organization, uh, largely based around administrative qualities uh, that have nothing to do with, I mean, if we're being open here, practical occultism, uh, you know, day to day living with the mystic, uh, mystical side of life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what these guys put on the line. That's what they arguably uh, uh, invested in and uh, influenced our craft in that way. Uh, so, no. In short, yeah, that was the long. The short is no. We we wouldn't be the same. I don't think. All right. No, I'm gonna have to agree with you there. I mean, ab absolutely. Um, without this uh, this gentleman who coming in where, when he came in, uh, with the connections that he had, both at the the fraternity level, um, the, the the royal society level, the um, you know the um, the upper level part of the government. Uh, yeah, it's just it's something that. Um, the timing was right. He was in the right place at the right time with the right set of skills. And, and timing is everything, right? So um, fascinating, fascinating guy, uh, fascinating engineer, fascinating um, minister, fascinating Freemason, fascinating alchemist. I mean, just this guy, he was the whole package. Uh, and, and I really uh, look forward to doing more deep dives uh, into research um, on his life. So, yeah, I don't think that... Um, masonry as we know it today would be there especially no third degree um <clears throat> that that we can uh, set up that that three-tiered system that we're familiar with today uh but certainly um a great great influence on the foundation and then therefore the future of the fraternity uh in 1719 going forward um so with that i hope you enjoyed it um we really appreciate having you here we'll see you next week and thank you for watching and keep searching for more light have a good night Thank <laughs> you.